Hi and welcome to this lesson on Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night by Dylan Thomas. This is an incredible poem. It's uh, really powerful if you've read it already. It's quite obscure at times, like difficult to understand. So hopefully once we've gone through this, you'll feel really confident on it. And uh, yeah, I, I really like this poem. It's always, I think I first learned it when I was about maybe... 20 or so I remember doing it at university and I didn't actually quite get what it was on about at first um but yeah I had someone explain it to me and I was like oh cool the most clever thing I think about it is that it's a villanelle and we'll look at that in a in the form structure section so the form of the poem that it is is a villanelle form these are almost impossible poems to write. I've tried maybe three or four times in my life to write a villanelle and <laughs> I've never been that happy with them. They're so difficult to get right and he just kind of, the way he writes this one it seems almost natural like it just happened to be in this form but it must have taken him absolutely ages to get it all kind of working structurally together. So the main message of this is from the title and from the first line, don't go gently into night. Night in this sense is symbolic of death. Don't die peacefully. It's the opposite of what we're generally told about death. It's kind of the opposite of what most people think that you know you pass away peacefully and that's a good thing. In this one, it's a poem by Thomas to his father as his father's dying. And he he's sort of overcome with this like almost selfish emotion where he's like, I just don't want you to die. I don't, I'm not ready to give up on you. I'm not ready to lose you. So I need you to kind of hold on a little bit longer, which is why it's so powerful and personal, I think, because it is born from a really personal moment in his life, Thomas's life. So the first thing to do, as with any poem, is read it aloud to yourself. I want you to pause me, read it aloud, and then when you're ready, we'll jump into all of the analysis. So a few vocab things to start with. Rave has a double meaning, or kind of several meanings really. Um, it can mean a lively party. <laughs> so it can mean a kind of, you know, a rave party. It doesn't mean that in this sense. It, it kind of either means talk enthusiastically and passionately about something like you'll you know give something a rave review or you're raving about so and so's latest album something like that it means that you're really happy about it but it can also mean you're on the point of madness or delirium like you're speaking in a way that barely makes sense and he says that old age should burn and rave at the close of day so it should be passionate Either way, it might mean that it should be kind of almost delirious and mad, or it might mean that it's enthusiastic and positive. But either way, there should be this kind of strong emotion at the close of day, at the you know point of death. He talks about deeds. Deeds are just anything that is done, an act that you do in a serious or strong manner. Meteors are small rocks that kind of float through space, and sometimes they actually land on the Earth. They enter the Earth's atmosphere, and when they do that, they look like streams of light in the sky, so we call them shooting stars. But they're basically meteors. Grave is an adjective, and it means serious and important, but again, this double meaning, it means relating to the grave as in a graveyard. So he's playing around with a lot of double meanings here, and when you analyse those in essays, that's a really high-level thing to talk about. So definitely make sure that you're confident analysing them in a double sense if you're aiming for a high level on an essay. Gay in this sense means happy and content. So obviously the modern meaning is quite different. In old fashioned times, the word gay only meant happy. It didn't have any other kind of associations. So I've got a little summary here for us. The poem starts with a command, an imperative command. Don't go gentle, don't die gently. 
People in old age should burn and rave. They should be passionate and fierce. They should rage. They should fight angrily and powerfully against their death. In stanza two, we're told that wise men know that they'll die, that dark is right, but they still refuse to die peacefully because they want their life to mean something, to make an impact. Even if they have not forked lightning at this point, they hadn't been powerful enough to jolt or change the course of humanity. They still should try, even when they're at the point of death. They shouldn't just give up and accept it. In the third stanza, good men also rage. So wise men, then good men. Good men are sad or shouting, depending on your interpretation of crying. Another double meaning there. About how bright their deeds might have danced. So how much of an impact they could have made on the world. So all of these different examples he's giving, the good men and the wise men, it's all about what have they done, you know, what impact have they made through their lives on the world, around them, and in a wider sense. The last wave by as a phrase also has a double interpretation. They're waving goodbye, or their life is like a wave that crashes and leaves the impact of its deeds on the world. And I think he's deliberately, again, playing around with that double meaning maybe waving weakly goodbye as you go, or this wave that your life is, and as it crashes and kind of dies, there's all this wreckage and stuff that it leaves behind, the deeds that you've left um, as an impact on the world. Stanza four, we have wild men. This is kind of like our ancestors, people who are more primitive than us. They learned to harness the powers of the sun and they worshipped or sang to it as it moved across the sky. They're uneducated and they learn too late that death will happen to them, but they still react with rage. So even people who don't know what death is or, you know, that they're going to die, they'll still react with this rage. So all these types of men, good, wild and wise, they all react passionately and fiercely in the face of death. Stanza five, we have grave men, serious men, but also men who are close to the grave near death. They have a clarity of vision. They can see with blinding sight. Maybe everything at the end of their lives suddenly makes sense. Maybe their experience gives them a more clear, but also more complex understanding of the world than younger men. Even though they're almost blind with this sight, they can't really engage with the physical world anymore and they're more focused on spirituality, they're still gay, they're happy with their life. Like I say, it means happy there. <laughs> so we have this idea of no matter what type of person you are, all of these types of people react fiercely to death. The final stanza takes a shift in tone. It's more personal and it talks specifically to the father. So it's not about types of men anymore. It's about one person, the father. And it kind of feels like he's been building into this and he didn't really know how to start it. So he's he's starting with these grand ideas of different types of men and how they react to death. By men, he means people. And then finally, he's like, well, you, my father, where do you fit in all of this? What type of man are you? It doesn't really matter because you need to act passionately and you need to fight against your end so we realize it's been building up to this moment and he says he asked the father to curse and bless him with his fierce tears so show tears show a sign of life whether you're sad or passionate or angry if you cry at least it it shows something it shows some kind of emotion so you have a feeling that the father is not his usual self. He's kind of on his deathbed at this moment and he's not got his liveliness about him. And he's saying to his father that he wants to see a sign of life. Even if that is painful, he would rather see that than nothing. So the very final two lines, they combine together and they say, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. So basically, don't go gently and quietly into death, rage against the end of your life.
In terms of speaker, this is definitely Thomas himself speaking specifically to his own father. So you can analyze it that way. The speaker is not always the poet, but in this case, it definitely is. It's mostly a third person omniscient narration while he goes through different types of men. And it only switches in the final lines to first person using the possessive pronoun my and my father to show that this whole time he's actually just been speaking to his father all along. It's so personal and so emotional for him, this topic, that he kind of has to talk in this grand, omniscient, third-person way before he can actually even sort of manage to get that personal feeling in there in the final stanza. couple of language techniques then. There's a lot of oxymorons and contradictions here. And I think that the best one is curse, comma, bless me now with your fierce tears. So curse and bless, they're imperative verbs, they're commands, and he wants to be cursed and he wants to be blessed. These are almost the opposite thing. They're oxymoronic because they're antithetical, they're opposites. If you curse someone, it means that they have <laughs> some kind of difficulty placed upon them. And if you bless them, it means that something positive is going to happen to them. But what he's saying is, I just want some strong emotion. I don't care if it's negative for me or positive. I just want to feel something and I want you to show a sign of extreme life. This idea of tears as well. People cry at moments of happiness intense spirituality, sadness and anger. So it's very ambiguous, ambiguous meaning we don't quite interpret it in a direct way. Fierce tears also has assonance, so it draws attention to itself. And he'd basically just be happy and sad if he saw his father crying, but he'd rather that than nothing. There's a sort of symbolism or metaphor going throughout the whole poem, the idea of light and dark and light representing life and dark representing death. This is quite classical and a lot of poets use this type of symbolism in their poetry. So you might have noticed this in other poems that you're studying as well. He uses a lot of verbs, dynamic verbs with energy to them, strong, violent verbs, burn, rage, rave. And he uses imperative verbs to command his father, do not go gentle, rage against the dying of the light. These are commands and they show a desperate and pleading tone. Tone is always a really high level thing to analyze in essays, so make sure whatever kind of essay you're writing, you should always do tone, mood, atmosphere, those types of things are considered um, very good to talk about. And also quite difficult to so make sure you're confident on them first. We have a lot of plosive sounds, which are P, B, D, G sounds. Blind eyes could blaze like meteors. We have this B sound, which is plosive, and that basically creates this explosive, energetic atmosphere. Again, atmosphere being a good technique to analyze. Blaze like meteors is a strong visual impression. It's a simile, and it shows that maybe blindness blocks off the physical world, but provides us with spiritual insight and higher knowledge. So there's this idea that the closer you are to death, the closer you are to this kind of spiritual way of being, especially if you're a religious person, which Dylan Thomas is, and his father also is. So the idea that the physical world is disappearing and you're more in tune with the spiritual world. So I'm going to talk about this villanelle. Because a villanelle in itself is quite complex and it contains lots of structural points within it, this is the only form structure I've given you for this one because I think that this is just the main one that you'll always be talking about. So I'll spend a little time uh, kind of <laughs> trying to explain what a villanelle is here. So first of all, it's a very strict form, which I think shows a lot of control. Like he's trying really hard to control his father's fate. He's almost fighting against nature and life itself. You know, it's normal for his father 
to get old and pass away. And he's fighting against that. He's like, no, I don't want that to happen. So he uses this very, very strict controlled form of a villanelle to achieve that kind of sense of needing control. Each stanza is a tercet, that means three lines. And the final one is a quatrain, meaning four lines. So all of the stanzas are three lines, and then you'll notice that the last one is four. The opening tercet has do not go gentle into that good night as the first line and rage rage against the dying of the light as the last line with an extra line in the middle. By the end of the poem, these lines come together and they form a rhyming couplet. So it's like these two ideas are separate at the beginning and as he's explored them throughout the poem, they eventually harmonize and become one complete couplet. This creates a sense of the conclusion. So we realize that the final message has been there all along from the beginning, but he's not quite been able to say it until the very last two lines at the end. It oscillates back and forth. So each tercet has one of these two couplet lines within it. You'll notice each of the middle tercets. So they kind of switch back and forth right until the end stanza. Personally, I think this represents the boundary between life and death or this tension between fighting and accepting or this tension between what the speaker wants, what his father wants, what's natural and what's personal because he's actually fighting against nature by saying, don't die peacefully, <laughs> don't disappear, I need you to stay alive. So as a summary, we have this very strict formal structure, a regular rhyme scheme and a controlling nature. And we have this oscillation between two different lines that are harmonized at the end with your villanelle. Hopefully that makes sense. Feel free to pause and just read through my analysis in a bit more detail there if you're like, what is she on about? Or if I'm still not explaining it properly to you, feel free to Google villanelles as well so that you get more confident on them. If you can analyze this, that would be an extremely high level thing in an essay. So it is worth putting your time in to kind of understand this form because it, it will just pay off when you're analyzing. So finally, then we're just going to have a look at some attitudes, some context, and I'll leave you with some themes to have a have a think about as your kind of end to the lesson. So with attitudes, these are the opinions that are in the poem. The first one, which is quite controversial, like I was saying, is don't accept death gently, fight against it. This is unusual, but this is born out of a genuine love and attachment to his father. He's not ready to let his father go. Another attitude is that great people make a large impact on the world. So while he's talking about these different types of men, he's actually talking about types of people. And he pedestalizes his father by placing along him alongside the greatest men in history. He feels like there's so much more that the father could do before he dies. This is a very important one, that grief is painful and passionate. So the father might be, you know, peacefully slipping away into death and accepting that this is the end of his life. But the son is not in this mood at all. He's in pain and he feels passionate and he wants his father to feel the same. So it's an exploration of Thomas's own grief and stress. He knew that his father was dying at the time that he was writing this poem. And he's kind of desperate. He has again, this desperate tone. There's also a sense underneath this that he almost knows it's selfish and it, it's kinder to just say, you know, it's better for you to no longer suffer. You've lived a good life. I'm going to cherish memories of you. But he can't quite bring himself to do that. He, he just isn't ready to let him go. So a couple of important context points then. He said, the only person I can't show this poem to is my father who doesn't know he's dying. So the father at this point doesn't, hasn't actually been told that he's got terminal cancer, but Thomas knows, Dylan Thomas knows. So it's this struggle between, you know, not telling him, begging him to fight, knowing that the death is inevitable, 
and then writing this very personal poem that shows just how much he loves his father, coupled with the fact that he can never bear to actually read it to him. So it's it's a lot of really intense, complex emotions all kind of clashing into one very beautiful and very powerful poem. I feel like maybe it was more of a way for Thomas to let off his own anger and sadness to kind of just like explode that out onto a page. He's quite, in his writing career, he's quite an emotional person that way. Um, so I feel like it's almost a thought experiment that he's using to try and explore his own emotions rather than ever being deliberately intended for his father to read. So he changes our interpretation of the poem as well. It's not, it's about the father and it speaks to the father, but the father never actually reads it. It's more about Thomas himself. He obviously had a strong relationship with his father. His father was an English teacher who introduced him to poetry and writing. And um, he was a poet himself, but he'd never been published. So there's all these kind of personal connections between the father's life and then how Dylan Thomas copied him and also surpassed him in his own life. After Thomas's father died, it really impacted his mental health, Dylan Thomas's mental health. He had an unhappy marriage. He was an alcoholic. Poetry was an outlet for him, like I was saying before. He himself died tragically very young in 1953, a year after his father's death. So he's already at a state of kind of mental turmoil and stress at this point, And it kind of tips him over, over the edge, the death of the father. So this is quite bleak, obviously, as a context point, but I feel like it's really relevant and it's important because... There's so much passion and emotion behind this poem. You have to kind of understand why, like, why is it there? So it's there because Thomas is this explosive, passionate character himself. He's also a problematic character and he's not perfect. and He has his own issues that he's kind of not able to deal with. So finally, then we have some themes. If you have a think about these themes, how they connect to the poem, which quotes might connect to them what Thomas's messages are on these, then you'll be really well prepared for any type of essay question that you might get in an exam. So I'd like you to do that as a final exercise on this poem, just to sort of solidify everything that you've learned today and yeah, figure out your own opinions on what's going on here. So hopefully that was useful for you and you're not too depressed. <laughs> it's, I don't find it entirely depressing because it is, it is a sad poem, but it's like, it's obviously really beautiful as well because he loves his father so much and it's such a kind of unusual reaction I think to the the like death of a loved one or the imminent death so yeah it's just um I, I feel like it was a really strong <laughs> strong poem when I read it and I don't necessarily get depressed by it so hopefully you feel quite similar even if you do feel like it's sad at least you um you know you know how to analyze it well and you can get a good grade on your essay with it as well so thank you for listening and I'm sure I'll see you in future lessons.